we have a wonderful webinar uh, with our as pretty much our resident health expert, Chris Duncan, who is talking to us about daily rituals for happiness and success. Now, Chris is a wellness and fitness industry expert with a career spanning over two decades. He is the founder and owner of CD Fitness in Perth. His passions lay in body transformations, functional movement, and rehabilitation for the busy professional. So once again, thank you everybody for joining us. And Chris, thank you once again. Uh, did you want to expand a little bit on what you'll be discussing today and why you thought it was such an important topic uh, to, dis uh, to talk about in the current climate? Yeah, sure thing, Kate. Um, so... I've sort of noticed recently, I mean, especially with what's happening around Australia with the, with the lockdowns in various states and things like that. One of the things a lot of people say, both in my consults with me, uh, as well as just general discussion is time. We're always time poor. And I don't know about you guys, but you're always saying yes and taking on more and taking on more. And it's just go, go, go you get to the end of the day, if you do get some downtime with your loved ones or family or friends or whatever, it's an exhausted time. You, you, you're barely enjoying it. And one of the saddest things is you can come away from what is a jam packed day and be dissatisfied with your efforts of the day or, wow, I really didn't achieve much despite the fact that you're on the go. And that creates stress. It creates um, concerns and one of the things I will be talking about today is decision overwhelm mm -hmm. and decision fatigue which is something that comes from all of that and one of the reasons why I sort of chose to speak about this now is trying to put a silver lining on what's happening around the world at the moment is while we do have this potential extra downtime through uh, you know stepping down from work or being in, in, in home is what better time to, to try to work on some practices and rituals where you maybe don't have that hour commute or you've got that extra little bit of time. And rather, rather than scrolling, which is one of the things we've spoken about before about that digital time, rather than spending more time just scrolling or watching a, another episode on Netflix, we can do these positive things and they're just small rituals. I'm not expecting, you know, two hours a day of guided meditation or anything like that. It's just, little practices that you can slowly implement, you know, and over the next few weeks, add a little bit to your practice, add a little bit to your practice. The next thing you know, you've got this routine and you know, when work does return back to normal, or if you choose to go a separate path, you've got this amazing ritual in place that you just, just improves your life. I mean, you can, we're talking money saving aspects, stress relieving aspects, actually buying more time back, which seems odd to, put more time in which gives you more time but it's hopefully by the end of it you'll see that you can save a bit of cash and have some more time while enjoying and hopefully as I say get into the end of the day feeling satisfied that you've actually done something positive yeah absolutely um I'm, so you say daily rituals are you able to give me a couple of examples of what those daily rituals could be unless you're going to get into it a little bit later on in oh, the yeah. I'll definitely cover them a little bit later. There's, okay. there's no real rules as to what they can be. But for me, I'm going to speak about six of them today. So actually, I might just flip through and go to where I... There we go. For me, there's sort of six rituals that I want to talk about. Um, I think one of the most important is a nighttime ritual. Okay. Because the nighttime ritual helps set you up for the next day. It also helps you get a better quality of sleep. Mm. So that little bit of, you know, say half hour before you retire at night, buys you extra time the next day. But it also gives you a quality of sleep, which means you're more refreshed for the next day. Obviously, if you've got a nighttime ritual, you want a morning ritual to help you get up and be prepped, fired up, ready for the day. Um, I'm actually going to speak about a morning affirmation. And it's something that my mentor got me starting to do. I, um, I went back to the original one that I wrote. It was January 20 that I wrote my first and that is absolutely a work in progress, but I found the original one that I wrote. I'm actually going to share that my whole morning affirmation with you guys today. Um, and there's a nice little addition to one of the things, because one of the things in the affirmation, one of the, what I consider to be a long-term goal has actually come true last week. Uh, it came to fruition last week. So I'm pretty stoked about that. Um, but it doesn't have to be those sort of rituals. A meal plan is a ritual or a practice to get into habit. And, 
that's one of the ways that you can really save money, you can save time, uh, and really reduce decision overwhelm. Um, and of course, an exercise plan and practicing gratitude. Those are the six practices I want to speak about today. Though again, there are lots of other things, but hopefully by the end of today, we've got an idea of some things we can implement. Um, I do want to sort of talk about easy ways we can introduce them and come away with some ideas of things you might want to implement in your daily life. Beautiful. Well, I'll let you get started. Um, I'm really excited. This is going to be wonderful. Sure. So one of the things that one of the reasons why this sort of came to me today or you know, that I wanted to present this is this concept of decision overwhelm. And we just in know each of those decisions that also, or the, the rituals that I spoke about, we are making something ridiculous. They studied to found about 35,000 or more decisions every day. And those decisions, whilst they might seem like nothing, they end up affecting us mentally and creating a, a decision fatigue. And the unfortunate thing is, if you're having to constantly make those decisions, and I, like it, we don't think about the fact that we're making decisions, but to snooze or not to snooze, do I get up and do I just go straight to the shower or do I practice hydration before? Do I go through a nice meditation and breathing sequence before I start my day? Do I have cereal or eggs? Do I, you know, all these, what do I wear? Do I go the red tie, the blue tie? Do I, you know, all of these things in our, in our mind, do we do the right thing and cut the sugar out of the coffee? Do I go latte, cappuccino? Like the, everything is a decision. The unfortunate thing is 35,000 choices that we've mentally got to make when it comes time to actually making important decisions, we're affected. And that decision fatigue plays a role in what we do. I mean, from a health point of view, if you're not following a meal plan and you okay, well, what am I going to do? You're at the end of the day, it's 5 30, 6 o'clock, you're on the train home or you're driving home, traffic's horrible. Look, I really should have some, some fish and salad or a chicken and veg. Oh, we have a takeaway because it's an easier choice. Whereas if you've got a meal place in plan, uh, in place, you got that choice. You don't you don't have to think about it. And you've you've shopped accordingly, you come home and it's there. Fascinating study about decision fatigue, and this is what this next graph's all about. They did a study on Israeli prison systems. And what we're looking at on that screen there, early on in the day, that first point where it says 0 0.6 to 0 0.7, and that first dot, that reference point is favorable decisions in favor of or rulings in favor of the prisoners. So you can see early in the day, the decisions were quite favorable. About on average, 65% favorable decisions. The two green markers in the middle of that graph there are where they've taken a break and had a meal and things like that. So you can see there's a pretty rapid decline from 65% to almost 0% favorable decisions uh, pre-break. So, you know, that's a massive change. They take a break and it's almost instantly returned back to favorable choices. But you can see how quickly that declines back to, and it gets down to about 10% before the second break. So the decisions, again, are becoming less favorable. So obviously the mental capacity to make choices or, or to rule in favor of right or wrong, whatever it may be, are definitely affected by decision and fatigue. We go that second meal break, and you can see after that second one, it drops under 10% almost immediately. So by the end of the day, almost all decisions, or less than 10% of the decisions were made, were ruled out of favour or not in favour of the prisoners post, uh, toward the end of the day. Now that's crazy to think that all of these things can have an effect on your choices that you make day to day. Now, if you're trying to make big decisions at work, forget the, the legal system, that, we don't know, those people in the late in the day may have deserved the, the ruling they got. But if you need to make big decisions on a daily basis and you are fatigued or you're making all these choices that I consider to be relatively unnecessary choices, how is that affecting your life, your business, your relationships and everything else in your life? So one of the things I want everyone to think about while we're here today are these three questions. What will you focus on? Is 
it an important decision, red tie or blue tie? Or is it just, I'm only going to wear the blue tie? Red doesn't make me feel good or whatever. You might have a power outfit. You might have a whatever outfit. And if it's a big meeting day, you put your power outfit on. If it's, you know, all these sort of choices. That's why I love uniforms. I think uniforms are such a great idea because it removes that choice. The next question I want you to think about is, is there something you can delegate? Can you get a virtual assistant if you're in business? Can you have other people doing your job? Is it something you need to do? And then are there issues in your life that you actually just need to ignore? Are they important? What, what are you actually giving mental capacity to? If you imagine you've got 100 points to use on a daily basis and choosing your outfit takes three points, choosing your six meal intakes, meal, snack, meal, snack, meal, snack, takes 10 points each, but it used half of our points. And all we've done is picked an outfit and eaten. We haven't actually made a decision yet. So I like to look at it as we've got X amount of points to spend or dollars to spend per day, mental dollars. Which ones are you going to actually spend your money on? Mm -hmm. Something important or what is really a day-to-day -day habit? So while we're going through some of these, I'd like you guys that are watching just to think about those three questions. What's actually important to you? So that when you get to the end of the day, you can look back and go, oh, I sat I I'm satisfied in my, my day because I actually achieved worthwhile things yeah. and spend my mental dollars on getting the right socks that are probably not going to be seen under your work pants anyway. Yeah. It allows you to be really strategic in how you plan your day. It's, it's great. I mean, I would love to see it in a, um, in a calendar context, even like, you know, where you structure your nine to how you structure your nine to five. And also when you decide to ask for that promotion, probably best to do first thing in the morning. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a, a great book called Presence, which helps you sort of mentally prepare for that kind of thing. But yeah, I'm sure there's a time when you wouldn't want to approach the boss. It would, I dare say, be very similar to the uh, favorable rulings um, from the Israeli prison systems. It's interesting when you look at some of the world's, like I've got some slides here for the, the some of the world leaders in both uh, politics and um, market. These guys Obama, president, the former President Obama, you can see here, he's quoted to say, I only wear gray or blue suits. I want to reduce the decisions I make so that I'm, you know, I mean, both what I eat and what I wear because I've got too many other important decisions to make. I mean, and if you have a look, if you think about Mark Zuckerberg, founder of, of Facebook, that's literally a photo of his wardrobe. <laughs> and if you look at any interview that he's ever done, he's wearing a various shades of the same shirt. Apparently there's a specific brand as well that he only wears that shirt. The most famous one that probably I can think of, and again, he explains here that it's, I want to clear my life of decisions so I don't have to make mundane choices so I can focus on the important things. I mean, that's Steve Jobs over however many years, it was like 98 to 2011. Okay, he's changed his shoes from the signature white New Balance to a couple of brown ones throughout those photos, but it's the black turtleneck, the, the dad jeans and the white trainers. I mean, that's, and he, he gave the exact same reasons. Like, why would I want to choose what I'm going to wear? That's unnecessary bandwidth. That's unnecessary thought process. So, you know, if you don't have a uniform, great. Let's pick a Monday outfit or Tuesday outfit or whatever it might be. Just remove that concept. Have it prepped, ready the night before. That's part of my nighttime ritual. And you'll see that as we go. So apart from wearing a uniform, um, you know, rocking a black turtleneck, what are some other ways that you can reduce decision fatigue and overwhelm? Yeah. Are well, there that, other small things, like other small rituals that you can put in place? Yeah, and that brings us back to the, this part here where we speak about the, the, the nighttime rituals. Mm. So if you wake up in the morning, and again, whether we choose to snooze or not, you know, if you wake, if you've got everything set out the night before, and I'll actually go through what I consider to be a, an important aspect of a nighttime ritual. Mm. So it's about getting into a routine and there's multiple aspects as to why we would do this, but we set a routine so that it can start the body's process of sort of deregulating, getting yourself down, ready for a restful night's sleep. That routine. Okay. I've got to be up soon. So you see the important note at the bottom, the time you have to be up will determine when you start this nighttime ritual. My alarm goes off at 4.45 every morning. So I count back from 4.45 
give myself an extra half an hour. And that's what time I have to be in bed by. So in order for me to be in bed by that time, I know it's kind of lame that I've got to be in bed by eight-ish, but <laughs> it is what it is. Um, prior to that, okay, well, if I've got to be in bed by eight, I need that down time too. First thing, device down. I use technology um, to put my, my phone automatically goes into do not disturb mode from about seven o'clock onwards. So if someone does text me, sorry, you're not going to hear from me until the next day because I don't get notified that they're trying to call outside of family and uh, a couple of essential people. Those messages just don't come through. Um, I make sure once I've done that, that I've got my, my day planned for me, it's, double checking that I know who my clients are, making sure I've got their programming all set. My programs are set the week before, you know, at least a week before, but I make sure that I've got, oh, someone needs that massage ball, I need that band, I wanted, and I've got my, my gym kit packed. So if you're not a trainer, you make sure that you've got your work clothes set out. Also, you pack your gym gear, because you know you're gonna need to be active that day. Always pack your socks and always pack your shoes. The amount of times people have rocked up without shoes to a gym session or whatever it might be, or they've had to rock their trainers to school, uh, to work the next day because they haven't packed their shoes as well as their gym shoes. And that just creates a stressful environment and just puts you in a bad place for the rest of the day. So we drop down the technology, we set out some clothes, we plan the next day, and that plan might be, okay, I've got this meeting at 10.30, I've got this presentation, I've got this session, whatever it might be. And you make sure that you're mentally running through how you want the day to be. So that if it runs that way, great. If not, you're not having to think about it. You go, okay, well, let's, let's pivot on the spot and let's change what we're gonna do. Uh, one of the things you can do is control the lights. Obviously, we don't want these blue lights from devices, but also really high, bright lights and you know, loud movies and stuff like that that are going to sort of stimulate us too late. Um, so control the temperature, control the lights, and then we start that process of down, like downgrading our, our system. Follow a nighttime hygiene routine, whatever that might be, shower, floss, clean, teeth, all that kind of thing, and in bed with enough time to read. That way there's no bright lights in the room. You're having a bit of a read. Preferably not something that's trying to take a lot of mental brain. Like I, used, I found myself reading a book and it was wanting me to implement all these changes. And I was, I was reading it. And I'm saying, oh, 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 he wants me to do this, and I've got to write this exercise. It was having the reverse effect. So it's more of a, an enjoyable read, something nice, uh, and then to bed. You notice, you know, if you read ten, some a few of my clients have said, I don't have time to read ten pages a night over a year is almost a dozen 300 page books. You know, if you think about that over a year, that's one a month, that's, it's, you know, that's pretty doable. It's only 10 pages, 10, 15 minutes. Hence why I said, work what time you've got to be up, go back 30 minutes and then start the process prior to that. So that's where I think a nighttime routine would be super beneficial for people. Now, again, that's something I do. I don't expect everyone to implement those, but each of those can be something you can implement. Obviously, if we've got a nighttime routine, how do we then start the day? Because we've had a full night's sleep. We got ourselves prepped. We got ourselves ready. Let's do the same thing in the morning. Wake up and get ready to, to absolutely own the day. For me, first thing should be hydration. This cup holds 500 and something mils. It's an imperial pint. That sits next to my bathroom sink. It's full of water the night before. Part of my nighttime hygiene routine is to clean my teeth, do everything else, and then fill that cup so it's sitting there, essentially room temperature water. I wake up and I consume that before I do anything else. Right, I have half a, at least half a litre of water before I move anything else so that I can start my day hydrated. Potentially some breath work, some meditation. In the ideal world, there would be some fasted movement, some kind of movement that you would do before putting some food in the hole under your nose. So we might go for a bit of a walk. We might do a, a yoga sequence. Again, nothing, nothing draining, nothing taxing, but just, just moving the body without food. For me, music's a big thing. I have like a five minute drive to work. It's not that long, but I get one good song in and every day this week's been the same song, at Buddy. It gets me up, I turn the music up, and for me, music's a massive part of getting my, my morning routine. If you have the ability to be exposed to sunlight, great. Have your coffee, 
sit out on the balcony or be outside, you know, the, the walk or whatever it might be and get exposed to some vitamin D if you can, if it's, if the sun's up, not for me, it's not, but as early as possible, get some sun exposure and run through a morning affirmation. And uh, that's what I was talking about before where I'm going to share my morning affirmation routine that I go through. It's something that I read to myself every morning. Uh, and those sort of things are things that can get you absolutely owning the day. So what I want to add here is that little note at the bottom, the important note at the bottom. So I said that the snooze button is a no-go zone. Now, for those iPhone, the snooze button is a nine-minute snooze. Doesn't seem like a lot. If you snooze every day, just once, seven by nine, 63 minutes, that's an hour lost every week. Just by hitting the snooze button once. Now, let's see if you do it once. <laughs> Back in the day, I set like a dozen alarms to ensure that I got up on time and there were snooze and snooze and snooze. Now, if you snooze just once, that hour could have been spent writing your meal plan for the next week, making sure your shopping list is set so that you don't buy those extra packet of Doritos or the box of Magnums doesn't end up in the shopping cart because you haven't followed your meal plan because you haven't shopped with a plan. It's amazing to think how many hours, well, obviously it's 50, 54 hours, in fact, if you snoozed every day, just once. It's 54 hours over the year. So when someone says to me, I don't have time, if you're snoozing, you could at least find an hour. So it's something um, we will want to consider. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, Chris, Melissa made a great point. She says, if you keep your phone away from your bed, you really don't really have the option of hitting snooze. But do you have any other tactics? Because I am an app, like, I think I hit snooze three times this morning before getting up. <laughs> do you have any tactics that you used to break this bad habit? Yeah, uh, so where we actually implemented a no phone in the bedroom rule to stop Ooh. nighttime scrolling and stuff like that. So we actually used a different device as the alarm clock. Mm. Um, so where our bed is, you've got bedside tables, bed, and there's a, a, like a bench at the end on the opposite wall. And that's where the alarm sits. <laughs> okay, so you're like physically getting up, moving to another space. Yeah, okay. you can't reach it. You have to physically get up and do it. Now, we, had, we stopped doing that because obviously me getting up as, as early as I do, I don't expect my wife to be up at 4.35 o'clock, that's just rude. Um, although she does come down and have breakfast with me every day without fail, absolute soldier with that. Um, so yeah, that, that's something that you could easily do. Just move the device or change the device. Okay. There's ways that you can use different alarms. There's some actually around where you have to physically go and change the alarm. There's actually devices out there where you can, uh, there are um, no snooze alarms where you, they, one's actually got a little, it launches something off the alarm clock and you have to replace it back onto the alarm clock in order to turn the alarm off. So there are those devices out there. Oh, wow. I actually, yeah. um, so sorry to interrupt, but I did hear <laughs> um, an interesting tactic that someone had, uh, had begun to use and had said that it worked, which was, you know, not just like waking up with your alarm, but also waking up in a better mood. And what she did was she, she physicalized it and she practiced it before it happened in the morning. So the night before she would set her alarm and re repeat this process five times, which was her alarm would go off. She'd sit up in the way that she wanted with a smile on her face. And then she'd do it over and over and over again until she was doing it in the morning. But yeah, she was just basically like, it was getting it into my body. It was, it was practicing the way that I wanted to wake up in the morning. So when I heard that I, alarm, I knew that I was bounding out of bed with a smile on my face in a good mood. In a good mood. Brilliant. There's a ritual. There's a practice. I love that. That's so yeah. good. Yeah. Um, with that being said, are there any ways that you would recommend people kind of start to ease into these new morning and nighttime rituals? Yeah. Don't try and change everything right away. It's going to take a few weeks to truly develop the habits of what we want to achieve. So one of the things like, okay, we've got the morning routine slide up now. Just start with hydration because that's one of the things that will actually genuinely it's, it's what I'd consider to be low hanging fruit. It's something easy to do. You have a glass of water before you do anything, but the result 
from that or the, the benefit your body's going to feel from that will be huge. So start with anything, anything that you think could be beneficial, try it. Give yourself an honest, you know, checking on, check on yourself honestly and sort of go, well, did that make a benefit? Did that make me feel good? Yeah, it did. great. Keep doing it. And then once you go, okay, I've made one change and I feel good for it, what can I change next? One of the hardest things, or one of the things I see a lot is people go, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to stop drinking and I'm going to give up my coffee and I'm going to go gluten free and I'm going to train five times a week. And within, a, within three or four days, they're, they're angry because they're uncaffeinated. They're, all they want is some sugar. Their body hurts because they're training so much. They're tired because of everything else. And all they want to do is be human and have a chocolate bar and everything else. One change every week. It's all it needs to be. Like yeah. nutritionally, I would take the Pepsi challenge against anyone and just sort of say, if, if you honestly think you need to make more than 26 changes in your diet, I, I don't think many people would. A change could be as simple as we're going to add breakfast or we're going to add a piece of fruit. If you made one change every week, within six months, that's 26 changes. You know, within six months, you've essentially got the perfect nutrition plan. 80% of the perfect nutrition plan. Yep. And you haven't made drastic changes. So if we introduce these rituals, one thing every week over the next month, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, there's six things that I've added on into a morning routine. In the next month, we're almost on the way to a perfect morning ritual. That's how I would introduce it with anyone. That's how I work, any nutrition client I work with. It's just, just baby steps. Let's pick off some low hanging fruit that'll get you a good result early so that you know that this stuff works and then just build from that. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, it is scientifically pro uh, proven that these small wins encourage you to keep going, which is why it's you know better to kind of implement these things. In, yep. in small doses. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And for me, the low hanging fruit principle is the best thing ever. Make a, make a change you know that's going to make you feel great, that it's not hard to do, but maximum bang for the buck, and then see what comes from that. So, as I said, I'm going to share my actual um, my morning affirmation. So, the aim of this is just a reminder to tell you why you're doing what you're doing. I include a where I want to be. So I actually speak to myself in the third person and I'll, I'll actually bring my entire affirmation up. Um, and then some rules or some principles. I've got a couple of quotes from various mentors and coaches that I've worked with um, as well as just really cool things that, um, that to me really resonate. And then there's some, some rules that I want to follow and things like that. So again, I've, I've, the examples I've used is pretty much everything off my morning affirmation. However, you guys can you know, build your own. Again, it's not set in stone. Mine changes sort of every so often. But I'll just switch which share we're doing. Let's switch to. Just while you're setting that up, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat or put them in the uh, Q&A section. I'm more than happy to uh, answer any either at the end of the session or throughout if there's an appropriate time. All right, so this is, this is actually my, my morning affirmation. I have it that I read out every morning. As I said, I speak to myself in the third person because it is how I want it. the world, you know, the world should, would, I would like the world to speak about me. So it says that Chris Duncan is, is liked and highly sought after for health professional. I specialize in improving quality of life and I, I talk about some things I want to achieve. I talk about that my wife and my dog um, have a beautiful house overlooking the ocean in an area called Jindalee. And what's amazing about this is this is my original affirmation that I wrote January 20 this year. I bought a block as close to the beach as you can get in Jindalee last week. So it's something that I, I set as one of my goals. And it actually, that whole sentence, my wife Claire and my puppy Delilah are moving to Jindalee when we build our house close to the coast. So this stuff, I believe it does work. That picture is Eden Beach, which is where we'll be moving. And the bottom picture is the our fresco dining area that we want to have in our house. And we actually sat with the builder and we are putting a wood-based raked ceiling in our house. So it's actually exactly as I envisioned it in my morning ritual. I go through and talk about what I would like to be earning 
every year and I have a number of, I've crossed it out, but I've, you know, what I would like to be earning through my personal training business. And I speak about my online clients as well, which also brings me a certain amount of finance. My life ambition is always to be, has always been to be a firefighter. So I said that I will, whilst doing that, continue to be a firefighter or I'll be a firefighter while continuing to be a trainer, as well as having some additional side projects, presenting, uh, doing some other additional courses and things like that that allow me to be enjoyable, constantly stimulated mentally, and allowing me to travel through work. So that's my first page that I read. I read that every day. That's, it's concise, but it's so impactful. <laughs> Just reminding yourself of those big goals. Yeah, why would I sort of go, oh, I want to be good? No, I, I, exactly what I want. There's an actual, you know, there's a specific dollar figure with each of those, because then I break that down and go, how many people do I need to see? What do I need to do? What do I need to achieve? And I remind myself all the time. So this helps with the visualization as to why. This is the why I do all of those things. That top mm. picture is my favorite place in the world is a running track in Los Angeles. Um, whenever we travel to LA, there's an apartment that we use and I run every morning down to the entrance of this track. It's called Runyon Canyon. And I run up to the top of Runyon Canyon. And just to the uh, left of that is where the Hollywood Hills and the Hollywood sign is and that's a view of downtown LA where my happy place is so that's one of the reasons why I want to continue to do what I do my wife and I are gypsies we travel have always traveled um, so for me it's very important and I've gotten to the stage now where that last picture is I would like to be in a place where I never travel less than business class so that's just a little reminder as to why I'm doing what I'm doing these ones are a little bit more specific um, Mark Wahlberg Topless, I mean, why not? Um, <laughs> he's there because he's 10 years older than me, almost to the day. Um, I would love to look like that t uh, 10 years from now, but he's also does a lot. He's got a hand in a million different pies. He owns, uh, uh, he's a, one of the top investors and owners of F45 Global. Um, he's a writer, a producer, an actor, and he's got a big family life as well as a big professional life with multiple life streams the trophy is a race that's done in australia you've got to compete three distances over the year to get the red the blue and the green and that triangle the delta is that you've done all three races three times in in three years so that's my goal i'm 40 in a few weeks so from the age of 41 42 and 43 i'm going to run the delta um i used to train Muay Thai, so I'd like to get a fight under my belt. Um, in my 40s, I want to do Kokoda and I want to do Machi Picchu. So my wife and I, Claire, Claire and I travel and we want to do some adventure holiday. That final picture is my big end game. That's something I want to work on. Um, but in order to do that, this is kind of my morning, my morning, my evening and everything else. And this is the rule. So again, I tell myself, I need to be active four times a week. This is my rules of life for, for, for me. This is specific to me. I'll nourish my body with quality, gluten-free food because I don't process gluten well. I don't feel good with it. Whether you do or not, it's your choice. But for me, that was important. I want to practice gratitude and acknowledge what I do achieve on a daily basis. Every Sunday, I will sit down and plan my week. So Sunday, I sat down and went, okay, I've got a presentation on Thursday. I have a meeting with someone else on Tuesday, which I had to go through. I have a workshop on Thursday and a weekend conference on Saturday, Sunday. So I know I had to then shift some clients to make sure everything was in place. I will plan my day the night before. I will be in bed by nine o'clock every night. Unfortunately, it's more like 8.15, but yes, I will be there. I put that I will read this formula every morning so that it is part of my routine. In order to do this, I need to reward myself. So every week I make time for myself to go to the beach, have a sauna, have a float tank session, have a massage, sit down with some friends and watch some fights, whatever it might be. And for me, my friends are super important. So what I call the core eight is my mum and my dad and my sister and five friends, uh, two of them over in London, the rest of them are in South Australia, that every fortnight I call each of them at least once a fortnight so that I, you know, that's, my rules of life for me. And the last page is just about some principles, things that people much wiser than I have said that resonated with me. So, so you know, things like don't let your past determine your future. You might've done some stupid things or let some things go. That was then, this is now. Um, tell myself to breathe. 
and then breathe some more. And there's a few other little principles that I just remind myself every day not to take things too seriously because they don't really need to be. So, sorry that I went on a little bit deep with my own little um. No, I loved that. I actually took a whole bunch of screenshots just to kind of create my own, you know, base. Um, but just so everyone knows, we do record these sessions and they will be available online at um, our VTB library at victoryoffices.com.au. Um, so if you do want, if you, you know, aren't making copious notes and you're just listening, you can find this, find this episode yeah. later down the track. That's actually how I wrote that morning affirmation. My mentor, Dan Henderson, was was talking about his and I literally screenshotted it all <laughs> and went back. If he was watching this, he'd be like, there's about half of that that's directly from mine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the next practice that I would love to see people do, and this is where I start putting my trainer hat back on, is meal planning. It's one of the things that we let ourselves down with the most. Most people think the gym side of it is hard. Realistically, it's the food side of, of the healthy lifestyle that is probably the hardest. Um, so when you are writing a meal plan, I want you to sort of consider each of the main food intakes. Whether you follow the process or the concept of intermittent fasting and eat in a window or eat as soon as you wake up, doesn't matter. But every meal in your plan or every meal that you're going to consume needs to be accounted for. So that you, like I said before, if you were driving home and you've had a rough day and you're tired and stressed and just can't be bothered, you're just going to grab a pizza on the way home. If you've got a meal plan, I don't have to think. I know what's there. But also, I've made a shopping list based on what's in my plan. Therefore, I know Tuesday night, 5.45, I'm driving home. There is chicken and veg as per my meal plan in the fridge ready to go. I don't have to think about anything. It's just there. And that hour we saved by not snoozing in the morning, we spent building the meal plan and shopping accordingly. So therefore, it's there. It's not a problem. It hasn't cost us any more time. So in there, as I said, I think it's important to have all of your meals and all of your snacks. But even more specifically is, is the quantity. Rather than just going, oh, I'll buy a bag of carrots, I'll just get a, a, a whatever. Only buy what you need. You know, your shopping list should be specific down to, okay, you know, we need X amount of broccoli, X amount of this, X amount of that. You know, oh, I'm gonna buy a kilo of chicken, but do you need a kilo of chicken? Unless it's a bulk pack and you're gonna freeze some and portion it off later, that's great. That'll save you some money long term. But having an idea of only buying what you need keeps the stuff fresh, keeps you enjoying your food, and like I said before, will save you money. If you go to a shop, the two, two worst things you can do when you're doing your grocery shop, shopping is go hungry and go without a plan. If you don't have a plan, that's when the additional stuff will just get chucked in. Oh, there's some buns that are, you know, that'll be useful. Or well, what if someone comes around, I better have a packet of Doritos in the cupboard or just in case, oh, we don't need them. You know, again, if you've planned your week, you'll know that Saturday someone's coming around. So you do need the crackers and dip. You do need the cheese because that's when they're there. Um, but also shopping hungry. So again, plan, I'm gonna go grocery shopping. I need to make sure I've fed myself before because a hungry little critter will put a lot more things in the trolley than what they actually need to do. Super important, again, my important little note at the bottom is that it needs to be personalized for you based on where you're at with your nutrition. There's no point in me saying, oh, you need to change this, this, and this if you're already eating pretty well. There might be some things you need to refine a little bit more. Um, whereas if you're still living a lifestyle that's not ideal nutritionally, it might just be making one of those changes a week. So rather than trying to empty your shopping trolley, let's just start refining them, you know, a little bit less savage changes or something like that. It should be based on your goal. So not everyone should be ketogenic, the keto diet. Not everyone should be doing eight meals a day like a bodybuilder. Not everyone should do intermittent fasting. It really is an individual thing. And that's where having a coach, seeing a dietitian, those sort of things, you know, Instagram, YouTube, um, magazines may be a great sort of resource, but they're not really covering what your body actually needs. So having a coach in that instance can really help you out. Yeah, I think even just for a foundation, um, you know, beginning to understand what foods are going to be good for, you know, the goals that you, you know, set for yourself and then kind of adding 
and being curious by looking at things like Instagram and blogs and so forth and so on. But that foundation is really important. Absolutely. And I mean, the, the harsh reality is what is perfect for someone will not work for someone else. Mm. So you won't really know until you try. And it, it, again, keto is such a hot topic. And it would be great if everyone could do it and if everyone felt good for it. I did it strict for six months. I measured my blood every day. I took a blood sample every day and I used supplementation to get you know, exogenous ketones to assist in that. And I weighed my food and everything. And at the end of the six months, I felt worse than when I started. Okay, cool. So it's not for me, but I gave it a red hot go. And I can honestly say that wasn't for me. I was intermittent fasting at the time. Didn't work. I started adding breakfast, adding a snack, adding meal, and then adding dessert. I dropped 10 kilos in the first 12 weeks. I had more energy and felt better, less bloating, and all that kind of stuff that I noticed was creeping back in. Mm. Now, I love the fantasy of being ketogenic, and I love the fantasy of eating in an eight-hour window. My body doesn't like it, so therefore it's not for me. And, yeah, I think everyone sort of needs to have that trial and error and not just download or pay for a, an app with, that's got a meal plan in it and follow that for life. Because even as you, as you lose weight or as your goals change, your body's going to change. We get a whole new set of cells every so often. That means that you get a whole new body every so often, which means it deals with things differently, processes things differently. So, yeah, that little note on that, that's where I think a nutrition coach would be very beneficial for a lot of people because it's, it's a bit of a cowboy town, nutrition coach, nutrition, you know, there's so many theories and there's so many concepts that it's, yeah, it's a little bit out there. And they often feel very, um, very strict. Uh, so I love that point that you just made in saying that, you know, as our body changes, so do our needs and it's okay to kind of evolve, evolve with that. Oh, absolutely. There's a couple of industry experts that I listen to and I read their podcasts and I watch their YouTubes and everything else. And they are absolute proponents of, for example, the kid, there is a, a doctor over in America who follows the ketogenic diet and he, he, he swears by it. And they said, Oh, cool. What's your meal plan? He spoke about it. And it was the furthest thing from keto. And they were like, but I thought you liked it. He said, yeah, I just love fruit too much so I can never do it. And every now and again, he'll revisit, you know, once a quarter, he'll do a fast and bump himself back in for health. But he's just like, you know what? It doesn't work with my lifestyle. Mm. A gentleman who was really well known for the paleo diet kind of now turned around and went, yeah, I don't really follow that anymore. When I changed my training cycle, I just found that it wasn't, I didn't have the energy doing it. So this guy has got probably close to a dozen books out on how important the paleo diet was. And he himself openly talks about it. He's like, yeah, I've had to add some things that aren't really paleo because like, my body couldn't handle the training intensity. Yeah. I respect him for having the guts to stand up and go, yep, had to change it. Um, but again, at that time in his life, it worked when he added a new training regime. He needed a longer burning energy fuel and it just couldn't have it that way. Yeah. So we we're always changing. And if you, if you lose 10 kilos, you need less food. If you increase your training, you need more food. You know, so it's not a one size fits all plan for anyone. So next thing, exercise. Now, again, it seems funny. Well, what do you mean? I'll just go to the gym and I'll train and I come home. Well, we, we kind of need to plan it. Because for me, a really important concept is to think about your non-gym related movements. The reason I say that is I have a few clients that play golf regularly. Now, there's no point and their golf is very important to them. So if they're playing golf on a Wednesday and I'm training them on Tuesday, I've got to be really careful that I don't really fatigue their core. I've got to be careful that I don't have them sort of twisting too much. Apart from the increased risk of injury by having those muscles already fatigued, I don't want to ruin their golf score because I'm going to cop it in the neck next time I see them. But because of the training I did, they had a bad round and they can blame me for it. So you really got to include, sort of, you know, space it out. Oh, I've got a big meeting. I want to make sure that I'm ready. Maybe a good hard boxing session or a hit session pre-meeting can really get you ready to go. Or if you've had a really rough week, heavy deadlifts may not be the best thing for you. It might just be right, we're going to go into parasympathetic nervous system, we're going to go into that rest and restore, and we're going to do a nice yoga, a yin yoga session and breathe. So you sort of want to plan your week, and it really is important to do so. I like the idea of having 
say a dozen different types of things you should do. High intensity, a mind and body, a heavy lift, and some other things in there, you know, core, Pilates, things like that. And if you rank out Monday morning, right? Monday is going to be deadlift day. But Monday, you, uh, over the weekend, you might have had a couple of packets of Doritos, a few beers, or something that wasn't quite ideal. And you're a little bit flat Monday. Monday's not the day to do intense then. Okay. okay? So whilst you've got a plan, you've also got to be able to listen to your body and you know, be prepared to shift. But know that within your plan, you've still got to then swap Monday to Wednesday or whatever it might be. But that's an easy change because it's in a plan. So your plan should include a, a balanced program that looks at all of your concerns, injury, illnesses, medical conditions, previous injuries, that kind of thing. It's got a warm up. It's got some movement practices to fix those joints. It's got some resistance training. It's got some high intensity aerobic metabolic conditioning. It's got some other cardio and it's got recovery. Of course, we need rest days in there as well. Okay? No one should be training six days, seven days a week. Body doesn't need it. And again, just like food, it needs to be personalized for you. It's great to have a training partner, but if they've been in the gym for two years and you're just starting out, you're doing a different program. 100%. Okay. They shouldn't be lifting the same and they shouldn't be lifting the same reps either. Yeah. I just have a quick question. Um, sure. Someone has asked, does eating the same thing every day count as a meal plan? Uh, her fiance and her make, or their fiance make their lunches on Sunday nights and every day it's fried rice. It does take the stress out of choosing what to eat on their lunch break and contains veg and grains, but should they change it up a bit? I love that. Sunday is, is meal prep day for a lot of people because then it, it, again, it takes that thought out. So for me, it saves a lot of that decision overwhelm. It, there's no stress needed. You've got it, pushes all the way through. There, is a theory that if you have too much even of a good thing, you can create an intolerance to it. It's unlikely with the quantities that you're having in just a, like a fried rice meal dish. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, I don't know. I don't know the person. I don't know their situation. I don't know their health or anything else. Um, but, yeah, if you just, like, say, for example, you just become a spinach junkie and that's you, I'm going to have a, a green smoothie and I'm going to put them with my eggs. I'm going to have spinach salad and everything else. You actually can and create some imbalances or intolerances within your body. So a lot of people who are non-medically diagnosed as gluten intolerant or celiac are more just having a concern that they've had too much of it. So I guess my answer completely sat on the fence and I didn't really give a clear answer, but... Um, <laughs> it could be as simple as, you know, changing up what veggies you're putting in. So like still having that same meal week to week, but, you know, changing up what veggies are in there or changing up from brown rice to quinoa or, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah, absolutely. When I, uh, I've written a little ebook about um, making salads more exciting. <laughs> I'm born <laughs> in mind that that's all right. Um, but, yeah, you know, as simple as you've got five days. So maybe one day is iceberg, one day is spinach, one day is kale, one day is mescaline, one day is just green herbs. Mm. There's a massive variety there. Each of those will have different phytonutrients. You know, all those different changes, different tastes. Even something as simple as yeah, one day's got carrot, cabbage, tomato. The next day, someone's got cabbage, cucumber, and zucchini. Like there's lots of variation. You can change the oil. You can change the green. You can change the nuts or seeds, and you can change the veg. That's heaps of variety. Yeah. Then change the style at which you cut it. It can be big chunks, small dice, shredded or whole. And there's you know, a bunch of different ways that you can build what is essentially potentially boring, repetitive food, looks the same, uh, looks different, tastes different, smells different and has different colors. Well, as we but saw, we just, we, we saw that our meals have such a massive effect on our mood that I'm sure changing it up will once again kind of help those spikes in your day, you know, make you a more favorable person as it were. Yeah. And again, sitting on the fence, but there's two, for me, there's two, there's two preferences there. Have a plan, eat the same thing, meat keeps you consistent, mm -hmm. but I like variety so that you don't get bored. As long as the variety isn't Krispy Kreme one day, no offense to Krispy Kreme, I'm sure that they're lovely, but you know, having that, you know, junk food versus salad i like the idea of consistency with a plan and having the same thing every day but little varieties to keep you sane you know change the protein in it change the nuts change the oil change the dressing yeah. the, that's a great way to get variety 
Yeah, but if you are prepping on Sundays and you're having the same thing every day, that's such a positive step. As long as you can mentally and keep yourself doing it. I wrote and it as the, a note. Sunday prep yeah. day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in this kind of weather as well, slow cookers are the dream for meal preppers. Because you get a big slow cooker, chuck some protein, chuck some veg, cook it all through. There's your containers. You know, a one or two person household can get 10 meals out of one slow cooker. And you haven't really done anything. You put them in, turn them on and gone. You've come back four or five hours later and you've got this healthy meal, potentially healthy meal, or they're ready. Beautiful. So the last one I want to get through is, is just gratitude. The ability to acknowledge the good and give yourself an honest appraisal too. You'll see in the, at the end of the day, I've added a little dot point as to, you've got to ask, you know, did I get what I want? You know, no, or did you cause not getting what you wanted? So for me, the amazing thing about practicing gratitude, it can be in a journal, you can just sit through your meditative state or actually just take five minutes and go, yeah, my life's awesome. Or wow, look at today. I smiled and someone smiled back or you know, whatever it might be. There are journals out there. There's an amazing book called The, the Five Minute Journal. Uh, I can't remember who wrote it, but it's basically every day you just fill it out. The, the page is divided into two sections. AM and PM, the pages, you know, AM's lighter, PM's darker. And you just, you know, what do you appreciate? When you wake up, what do you appreciate about today? What, what's great? And you, you know, you'd be thankful for you know, family, friends, whatever it might be. And a bit of an idea of what you want to do. At the end of the day, what are you appreciative for? What, what good happened in the day? Did you get what you wanted? And if you didn't, why not? Was there something you did that caused you to not get it? Was there something you could have done more? It seems a little bit for some people, you start talking about that and they sort of think it's a little bit, a little bit hippie, a little bit out there. Oh, well, you know, don't worry about that. But actually sitting down and writing it, if you're having a bit of a bad day, a bit of a down day, you sort of have to sit there and go, I really did. Someone made me feel good or I, this is amazing. And I got another client or I, I did this and my client made a personal best or whatever it might be. You sort of sit back and go, oh, good day. Wow, life is amazing. And as you start to do it, you become more aware and more, again, a little bit out there, but you, you seem to receive more. When you're acknowledging the good, it's like you open the tap. And what starts is a little bit drip when you initially start. You've got to start, as it says, you may struggle to start. You have to really, oh, I'm, I'm grateful for my dog. She wags her tail when I get home. Like that's where you kind of start when you start journaling. And then all of a sudden it's, this, this big expanse opens up and you start being much more grateful for these big things. And yeah, it almost like it opens a door into more positives and you start to see life in a different way. Yeah. I love that. I um, was chatting. Uh, we, we had another webinar and they were chatting about gratitude and the speaker mentioned that when you feel that gratitude with your body as well, you know, it's so great to write it down, but instead of writing down these kind of boring lists of like, you know, I'm really grateful for, you know, my job and I'm really grateful for, you know, my pet, blah, 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 blah. Say things that you are actually really grateful for. And she made, she said one, she was like, I'm really grateful for my bed. Like when I, and she really says to embody it. And, you know, instead of I'm grateful for my pets, I'm really grateful when I get to get down on the floor and play with them. And when you like create like a body, experience it actually brings that gratitude into yourself and it you know obviously is a wonderful habit but it stops making it i think a chore if that makes sense that's such a Sorry. better way of what i was trying to say i hear i'm going you might struggle and you'll start with the little things that's exactly what i mean you'll sort of go oh this and next thing i love that delilah delilah's my puppy i love that delilah wags at hell and brings me a toy every time i get home and i drop my bag and i play with her and that's my first 15 minutes home every time so yeah, that's yeah. You do. You end up just embracing this amazingness of really specific, really detailed goals or um, gratitudes. Yeah. No, definitely. All right. So that's the six things that I really wanted to talk about. I, I sort of think we've um yeah so that were the six kind of practices that i wanted to talk about has there been any questions that have come through or anything i mean i think we've asked them oh um potentially um 
Oh, well, I've just had a lovely message from Mike who, who said, hi, Chris, thanks for sharing today. Awareness and appreciation of yourself is a journey. Embrace your space and love your work. Um, I, I am conscious of time. We only have a few minutes left. So look, I'll ask anyone who has any questions, please include them in the chat or in the Q and a, um, but while people are potentially writing those questions, Chris plug away, let us know what you're working on, where we can find you, how we can find you. Just before I do, I just want to leave everyone so that you've actually got a sort of a place to get started. Okay. Um, if, if like, again, I, I threw a, as I tend to do in these things, I just like I throw so much information out. Um, how to sort of get started from this, and that's one of the, one of the things that is one of the hardest things to do. Those first questions that I asked right back at the start, decide what's important. Okay, it's no point implementing a a, a really detailed meal plan if you're not sleeping or if you know there's other things that need to be addressed more or, or like I said aim for the loaf hanging fruit to get things in place but decide what's important to you uh, uh, I'd like everyone to like I said before start small now for me the A's B's and C's has been something that has been revolutionary and I thank my wife for introducing me to this concept so I'm one for notes in my phone and I could and I ended up with like 15 things every day and I get to the end of the day and be so unhappy with what I'd done in the day because I still had so much on my list. So break your days into A's, B's and C's. So the A's meaning what is absolutely essential? What are the, the non-negotiables? What do I have to achieve today? And it should only be three at best, four things in that A. B's are if I've got time, what can I get to? And C's are, you know, let, let's get to them when I can. That is a practice in itself. And that gets you to the end of the day. When you've ticked off by 10 o'clock, your three A's and you can start chipping away at your B's, they then become the A's the next day. Or you might add an A for the next day, but that's such a big thing. So if you are looking at starting, A's, B's and C's is such an easy practice to get into. Because again, low hanging fruit, you tick three things off that you need to do. It might be, I've got to close that bank account, I've got to write that presentation and I need to make that call. You tick them off and go, look at me, I achieved today you're feeling good and then you can move from that coaches I, like I said I'm massive in coaches I have four mentors that I actively work with at the moment I've always had a personal trainer I've been a trainer for 21 years but I've always had coaches I've always had trainers um, and I think that's really important and that can be again a trainer as a mentor a trainer as a fitness instructor a trainer for nutrition a coach or someone that you can just work with that's it, it can literally be someone a step or two ahead of where you are that can help you Make a shopping list, use the technology you've got access to, and chunk time. So, not sure what I mean by chunk time. Emailing for me is something I don't do a lot because I hate having to, I don't use my phone for emails and things like that. So, I've actually set two times, nine, you know, depending on where my clients are, there's two half hour blocks in a day, and I don't look at an email outside of those times. Wow. So, you know, food prep, it's only done through those times. All these little practices can sort of help. Again, chunking your time rather than 15 times a day logging in and checking your email. I only look at emails through two times. Outside of that, emails aren't in my brain. There's not a thought about them. That's 3.15. 3.15 is email time. <laughs> and then you can move the So chunking time is really beneficial as well. Time for sales calls, time for emails, time for social media posting, time for whatever. And that way, Part of your plan is to chunk time and only do those things in time. Um, would you mind if we, when I send everyone out an email after this, if we included this starters guide? You can include anything that's there. I can send you the, the, the presentation if you like. Perfect. That would be wonderful. All right. Yeah. Well, look, I don't want to cut you off <laughs> early, but we have no, reached no. 1.30 and so I'm very conscious of time. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. There's, you know, a lot of people are saying thank you and Diana, uh, Mike. So thank you from, from everybody. Um, cool. Where can we find you? Yeah. So yeah, we just sort of break out at the end there, but no, thanks for everyone. Thanks for coming along. And yeah, if you want to learn more about what I'm doing, just hit me up on CD fit and well doc uh, on Facebook. Yeah. CD fit and well doc, on Facebook. Beautiful. And I'll include that information in the email as well. Um, was there any last words, any parting wisdom? 
No, I looked, I said, aim for the low hanging fruit, get some small changes and watch that snowball into life changing routines and rituals. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, as I said, my name is Kate O'Connor. I am the events coordinator here at Victory Offices. And you would, if you would like to see this video again, which I'm sure you will, uh, you can find it on our website in the, the library. All right. I will say a big goodbye and hopefully see you next time.